Hi, Meredith and David. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Yeah, so it is our 200th episode, and you are with us to celebrate. Yay! Yes. Woo! Yes. Our special yes. guests. We made it to 200. I, I don't even know how many times David has been on our podcast, but <laughs> we, we couldn't resist having both of you back for our 200th episode because he wrote a new book that is part of Scholastic's Science, in Reading, Science of Reading in Practice series. So, you know, I just think that is so – these these books are so – readable. And so we're so excited for you to be part of the series, No Better, Do Better Comprehension. And we loved the first No Better, Do Better. We sure did. We, now we love the second. Well, thank you. I do want to just make a plug that the first book is back in print. <gasps> oh, good. Of not being in print. Oh so my gosh. It's on the right. So it's got a plain blue cover. It's only on Amazon right now, but it's avail- if you search for it, you'll find it. Um, so I just did want to just say that. You know, I, I need to figure out the Amazon marketing thing and figure out how to get it more prominent than the one that's out of print or how to connect them or something. But it is available if you're persistent and look. Okay. Well, Meredith, we'll be sure to link that in the show notes so that everybody can buy all the no better do betters (laughs) that they want in their life. (laughs) All right. So today though, we're going to talk about no better do better comprehension because that's part of the scholastic series. Um, But you played that title off of your previous no better do better, which is great. Uh, So we thought we'd dive right in chapter six of your book. We're skipping one through five right now, but (laughs) chapter six is all about the power of questions. And we're hoping that you can share what you mean by this and why questions are so important for comprehension instruction. Well, there's a lot to say. Um, At the simplest level, it's nice to know if the kid understands what they read and asking a question is the most direct point Uh, path. That, that's that's one level. On 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 a more powerful level, de- depending on what your goal is, if you ask a question and you include the student to explain their thinking, then you're getting a more precise window into what they comprehend, what they don't comprehend, as well as how they reach that point of either comprehension or confusion. Or sometimes both. On a third level, if when students are asked to explain their answer, as much as possible, they use not only evidence from the text, but what exactly in the text led them to that. In other words, I I realized that I didn't know the answer to this, and then I stopped and I thought about it, rereading it didn't help in this case, and very many times it doesn't. Um, And I realized they must have been talking about, they must have referenced something earlier. And then I thought, oh, okay. So it connects to what was in the very first paragraph or or in the very beginning. Or I was confused, and then I did go back to the question. And as I started reading it, I saw this sentence really has the answer, but it's freaking long. Um, So I'm going to have to slow down and read it differently. So those are examples of the features of a text. Are are connections made between different parts of the text? And also, are the sentences in the text complex and dense with information? You can have a complex sentence that doesn't have that much information, and you can have a complex sentence that has a lot of information. And both of those are what we call features of the text. And they, they determine the complexity or the difficulty. So there's three levels there. One, well, it's good to know if the kid understood what he was reading. Two, how he approached it. Um, and three, what were the features of the text that stumped her or what were the features of the text that made it easier to answer the question? And, and there's, there's even more going on with questions, that, which is why we're so in love with them and named that whole chapter. Um, around questions. One is a good question, well-crafted question, whether your materials do that for you and all you have to do is tinker a little or whether you don't have good materials or you're creating on your own, which is more challenging. But you can use a question to drive student attention to what is most important in the text, what is, what is most challenging likely in the text, 
or what's most fascinating in the text or, or any number of things. So a question can actually, it can actually be a scaffold in a weird way. So it's never felt that way as, as uh, to students, but if teachers really overtly say, I want to draw attention here, I don't want the students casting around over 20 page span because they're not clear. So I'm actually gonna include what paragraph to look for because I know I have a lot of students who need that pinpointing. So you can either craft the question to be scaffolded or just by its nature, by asking about something specific, a question is pointing student focus and attention to one element of the, of the, of the text. And I'm talking about good questions, well-crafted questions. The second thing is, David was talking about the processes that go on inside an individual reader, student reader's brain. And we hear all the time how frustrating comprehension is. Like the people sort of, they sort of know what it looks like, but they do not know how to get it. And we hopefully we'll talk about this more later. They know the things they're being asked to do in most materials aren't getting students to the heart of the matter. They're not actually leading to deep, rich, or even surface comprehension sometimes. So, so the idea of explaining your answer and doing it first, of course, it does peel back. It's a, it's a window in their kid's brain. Like how often do you get that? The things that David was discussing. But if you do it out loud, you know, pondering by yourself at times or pairing up or, you know, all different permutations, and then you discuss it out loud, there's this incredible power of elevating the entire room. Because if a kid got an answer wrong in explaining it, he himself may see, uh, oh, this doesn't, this no longer makes sense to me. I realize I missed something. Or the class itself can pitch in a common, can help that kid build a fuller understanding in a sort of collective way. If a student got the answer right and has, and then is pointing at the places in the text that gave him the answer, then all the students who weren't sure of that answer or didn't didn't find that evidence, you can bet they're drinking it in from their classmate because they, you know, we want to do well. We want to understand what we read. And so it, it can it can unlock the key to the kingdom, really, that it opens the vault um, for what comprehension actually is. So it's diagnostic power for the teacher. It lifts the teaching load to the, from the teacher to the students in this kind of social way. And it can pinpoint time and attention to what you most want kids to get out of the text. So we are madly in love with questions. That's about six or seven points. And I think we put it together really well, better than we often have. You know why? Because <laughs> it's in honor of the 200th podcast. 200th episode. I'm glad you got yourselves together for the 200th episode. <laughs> one, one, one last, code, one small coda to that. It's nice when the kid explain when 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 a student actually explains everything and nails it, um, instead of only the teacher. And you've just encountered some research that that may actually cause deeper learning or, or better retention when right. it's when it's right that the Harvard study, the Eric Missouri stuff. Oh, Florida, it, well, it's basically student answers a question, another student answers the same question. They come together. Um, they with, with different answers. If yeah. they differ, they can't, they're paired on basis. The program doesn't answer. say what happens if they have the same answer, which is a problem. But it comes together, uh, assuming they have different answers, they come together, they, they analyze, they, they, maybe they reach a conclusion or maybe they, you know, a consensus, and, and maybe they don't. And then the whole class comes together, and the whole class analyzes the question in the light of some of the answers they gave and in the light of the, the correct answer. It, it's very much the same as what we say in the book about explaining explaining your answer, but it's structured nicely and bringing in bringing in pairs and and whole class. Um, and it was just devised by um, a, a science teacher at um, right there, Eric, Eric Mazur at yeah. um, Harvard at Harvard uh, for actually for teaching undergraduate physics. The article's still up. That's what I was pointing at. <laughs> um, yeah, I like the sort of pyramid scheme of it, right? You go from pairs. We, at first, I thought it went from pairs to quads to the whole class, but I think he, because it's college, he probably hurries it up. Um, so it's not research, but it's a nifty, it's a nifty method that I, is virtually identical to what we have talked about in the book with explaining your answer. And close reading and, the, and close reading being more communal and social than it's it's often described as such a dreary enterprise, and we see it as this vibrant, <laughs> alive, you know, 
chunk of the day. Hard, hard work, and not necessarily, you know, joy filled and giddy with fun, but like really rich and really social. Well, we're really glad you just brought up close reading because that's what we wanted to ask about next. And because, I mean, when Common Core standards were first introduced in Baltimore, I mean, we went all in on close reading. It was like all we talked about was close reading. And I think there were some really good things that happened with close reading, but I think we went like overboard on some things, especially around. I remember talking about like everything you need is on the page, you know, and I'm thinking like, well, no, every reader's bringing what they know to this page, right? Like not everything can be found on that page. But anyway, close reading was just like the thing in Baltimore. And then it's sort of just, we haven't really talked about it much lately. We haven't heard many people talk about it. We even get some questions sometimes from listeners like, do you have an episode about close reading? So when we saw a chapter in your book, we're like, oh, good. They're talking about close reading and we're going to like clear up like, What's good about close reading? What should it really look like? So fill us in. Talk, let's talk about close reading. There's no, it, it's, it's important to point out that nobody's done a, a, a randomly controlled trial about close reading. So there is no knowledge of the best way to do it. Um, however, no one, not, and I've been looking for this for a long time, no one has come up with a system that the whole class can get together and, and with kids three or four years below grade level up to kids three or four years above grade level and everybody everybody engage in that text in, in a meaningful way other than something other than some form of close of close reading so and i would say that's because of this collective the social the social aspects of it and I, I would never want that to get set aside this I, the, the reason you can have an 8 or 10 grade span examining the same text is because you're doing it together and explicating. And I often, I often say that, it, you know, it close reading is closely and carefully reading some little chunk of text, but it's also the teachers hanging out close by your students as a coach. So the teacher stays close to the students and, and pays a lot of attention to the interactive interactions and understandings that are getting, getting built again in that small chunk of text. And then, Close reading is an ideal format for the kinds of student explanations that we just talked about. Close reading, and we haven't talked about this, close reading also, either in, if implicitly or explicitly, and it should be explicit, teaches kids the nature of complex text. If it, in the previous example, if you're stumped because you didn't make a connection that was of two propositions or ideas that were separated by three paragraphs, you're learning that that's one of the features that can make a text complex. How close, um, how many ideas are, need to be connected to comprehend the text, how close they are in the text, and how close they're related, other than being, other than being necessary to comprehend, comprehend the text. So if when you explain your answer in that third level that I discussed, where you use the features of the text, then you're teaching kids to... Um, you're teaching kids the nature of complex text and complex text gets talked about all the time, often with close reading, but we don't really spend a lot of time teaching kids. What is the nature of complex text? Why, what makes it complex and, and, and what can we do about it? And that's one of the key ingredients in, in chapter. To be honest, seven. I don't remember. The Six and seven. Seven, seven, yeah. Yeah. Seven, seven is seven this Seven one. is close reading. <laughs> do you, yeah. Do you have any practical tips? Like if teachers are listening right now and they're, want, you know, they're going to buy the book, I know it, but just in case they haven't had it delivered to their doorstep yet, chapter seven is close reading. And that's what we're kind of like diving into right now. Do you have any tips for teachers who want to try some close reading strategies? Like David, I just said, heard you say that it's important to, you know, acknowledge the elements of the text that make it complex. Um, any tips for teachers on how to do that? Yeah, I would. I would have a couple. One is you, you need to pick that chunk uh, carefully because it is tiring. It's tiring for the adult. It is exhausting for the kids. So it's this so short. I mean, we ne we did it. Our kids had a lot of stamina and it, it did build up their stamina. We did it four times a week for 45 minutes, I think, at our, yeah. at our height, at our own school. Um, I think 20 can be, can be really enough. And if, and if, but it, but it can be as little as five minutes if a math teacher is closely reading a math word problem. Like that's an amazing use of close reading. 
because oh, such I, a good point. Mm-hmm. There's so that could be a five minute, very useful time. So and I, that also I taught career in tech ed, and so we don't talk a lot there about you know beautiful literature, you know elegance, but we talk about highly you know highly utilitarian stuff. So. I would also say to teachers, it has to be a value to you and what your goals, your learning goals are in the moment. It has to, so it, it has to be small and it does have to be a valuable chunk of text, for, but the values in the eye of the beholder. There has to be stuff going on that you know your students are not gonna get if they just were left alone to read it off in their own corners. So a value to the teacher, short enough to be managed in the time that you, that you have or over multiple encounters if there's really a lot going on. Um, I think poetry, the, you know, getting away from CT is a great place to start because poetry is almost always complex. Even a haiku is really sort of profound. And it's usually, it, interestingly, it's because it's ordinary language, it's common words used in uncommon ways, right? And, and syntax starts getting messed around with. So Poetry can be a really short, quick thing, you know, thing to explicate and look at. So choose it yourself, unless your materials are fabulous and make really good choices. Um, it needs to be of, of high utility to you or, or something you badly need to communicate to your kids. Like at the tech center, we did safety instructions. We did close reading, um, you know, so that they could operate, the kids could operate material, you know, the, the machinery safely. Or when the kids wanted to be certified to do state level auto inspections, we prepped for the text through close reading and under, to understand that. I had kids who wanted to go to the military and their, their mothers would come in and say, help them get a higher score on the ASVAB. So we would do close reading with the ASVAB. So I, I think that it's really important for teachers to take hold of that and claim their power with, with close reading of value to them and, or of they know it's important to their kids and chunk it and know that it's tiring and know it takes time to get good at it and not try to wring every last thing out of the text. That's the last thing you can't, I mean, a really rich text is rich for a reason. You want some level of understanding, but you can't wring it dry and just leave it in, you know, tatters. That's what I was thinking. I'm, I'm from the secondary English world. So, you know, we love our novels and I was thinking, I'm like, you can't closely read everything. You sure well, should you. My goodness, yeah. <laughs> nor should you. Like every Taylor Swift song from the most recent <laughs> album. Should we? You can't close read all of those. <laughs> <laughs> that double album? Yes, absolutely. So, yeah, that's a really great example. So what in what you ask students to read or what, what you're reading now in a whole novel, what's worth, what is really pivotal? What, what matters? Where did characters surprise or, or pivot? Yeah. Like, and then you pick that. And like going those, back, Meredith, to like what I keep, you're keeping text at the center. We love that piece. Um, it, I, oh, I know. Yeah, we I know. know. I we lot. talked with her about it. <laughs> That's a loss. I think it has to do not, you know, not just with like that text at hand, but how does that text relate to all the other texts? And though, as you, as you said, but just to kind of stamp up for listeners, the world around the kids, especially as they get older, what's really important to them? What do they need? What, why should they be doing this? What's their interest and how is it going to help them so that they can see the value of then doing that in real, the real world for themselves? At, you know, I, I recently had to very closely read new car insurance documents to make sure that it was <laughs> in a different way, right? Like, very, but I think that there's um, ways that as kiddos get older, we can make it applicable to them and the text that they're reading, the text that they're reading in that moment, and the text that support those texts. A few things. First of all, um, make sure none of your listeners recommend using the Armed Forces Basic Assessment uh, text in elementary school. Oh, no. <laughs> Otherwise, you might not go on to your 201st podcast. Okay. <laughs> These were juniors and seniors in high school. <laughs> yeah. uh, a, a major point of the book was that there are these, these constructs that are, are underneath reading comprehension. Um, vocabulary, knowledge, fa- word recognition, fluency, an understanding of the, of the way morphology works. And, but if all of those are, are in place at some level, then what's left is what is there in the construction of this text that would uh, it corrupt comprehension or interfere with comprehension. And that is what we call the features of the text, how closely aligned the propositions are, how dense the sentences are, 
how, how, how much the author explicitly makes connections between ideas, how often the, the reader has to make those connections, um, and also how the text is written so that the reader will likely connect to relevant knowledge. And because you have relevant knowledge doesn't always mean you connect to it when you read. And then there's actually research about that by Kate Nation and Jane O'Kill, I think. So that's, that's, that's important to consider, but we don't, we don't really consider that. And considering that means that in terms of your original question, Melissa, as a technique, and this would work regardless of what program you're using, and, and some programs are way better than others, and some programs are way below the seller. Um, and, and you could do this with either one. And you can ask David on the side if you want. <laughs> We're going to drop David's email in the uh, show notes so everybody can get your honest thoughts on that. Read, read the text for what are the features that might make it carefully read the text. What are the features that might make it difficult? And then ask some questions about that. And you can do that even if there's, you're using a program that has questions and even if some of those questions are very good. And even if none of those questions are very good or very few are very good. So that's possibly the, the, strongest, um, the strongest technique. And over a period of time, if you do that as a teacher, you're going to learn what are the features that make the text complex. You're going to get a, a, a more expansive and in-depth understanding of what this whole complex text thing is about, which is a good idea since we brought that thing into the world like 12 years ago now, it's not like 14 years ago. Um, yeah. Because really, if you just ask the kids to read what, what the easiest thing possible is, is that we, we, you wouldn't be on your 200 podcast. Yeah. Um, so true. Kids would be reading at a second grade level and everybody would be. <laughs> um, I, there's a couple other implications to what David said and that point. I think that you said, Melissa, that not everything lives inside that four corners of the text. And we, we were a little ideological about that at first, too, because we were combating so much text to self, right? It's all about you and your feelings. Right. And, you know, so there was a lot, you know, everything has a historical moment, right? So there was a, there was a history to that rigidity, but it's obviously not true. And knowledge, the knowledge emphasis uh, rightfully puts the lie to that. There's, we also really leaned into curiosity in the book in a way that um, might belie the title. And there's, that's a two-way street too. Teachers have to be curious about their kids and, and imaginative about what's going to, to David's point just then, understand if you're teaching fourth grade, what is, what makes my, this group, this year, fourth graders stumble or, or what will they find easy? And then for the kids, they need to be invited to be curious, to be curious about text, be curious about the world, um, be curious about words and, and why they have, you know, the story behind words and why they're, you know, as opposed to bemoaning that a word is spelled bizarrely, like let's look at why that word spelled something. Like, oh, it comes from Greek. Oh, it you know came from Urdu into English or whatever. Um, so I, I love this idea of of staying curious about your children about the world. You know, it, it's this, this bicameral or multilateral um, uh, construct that I think is is crucial here because teachers can't if you're if you're a really good reader and most teachers are very comfortable you know with with the skills that they are imparting. And sometimes it gets confusing when, when your students in front of you are, are, can't do the thing that you find so valuable and easy. It's to get curious and, and try to inhabit what it feels like to be that restless butt in the chair of your eight-year-old kid that you're teaching and, and where they might be befuddled. That just really can open doors. Yeah. yeah. I wanted, I wanted to ask something about close reading before I forget about it, because I, I know that the first read and second read is what I'm really remembering. That was, that was the thing, like, you have to read it more than one time. And I'm wondering if you all can speak to that. And, you know, what's, what's the biggest difference between that first read and the second read? Once you've picked a really good text, right, you have that really good text, what do you do differently in those two reads? Well, the first, the first read is pretty straightforward. It serves two important purposes. There's oodles of research showing that if someone reads aloud a text um, with, with fluency and students follow along, that's one way to improve fluency. And weak fluency is certainly part, it, it's almost always, it's always part of children who are very far behind. And it's often part of children who are just behind somewhat. 
but and the second thing is it brings them into the text. So if you're doing close reading, if you you've got you're using a, a text in the fifth grade and it's at a fifth grade level, no matter how measured, and you've got some kids reading at the second or third grade level, reading it aloud with them following along is the first is the first step in bringing them into the text. And then this the the later reads depends on the length of the text, and it depends on the goals that you have, and it depends on how much you're focusing on the, what we've been talking about here. So more or less the way I've been thinking about it recently, as we wrote the book and as I, we talked to people about it, the second read should focus on some of those features of the text that make it complex. Of course, the goal is understanding the text. Um, so you, ha you craft questions that address the features of the text that make it difficult, whether they're density of information, syntax, lack of you know, authors not making connections and so forth. Then there's knowledge of words in the world um, because close reading is not the ideal way to, to grow knowledge of the world because the texts are usually short and it's a, a, a short amount of time and usually on a rich, short text. Um, but nevertheless, there is opportunities to learn about the world in, in close reading, especially with vocabulary depth, meaning why did the author choose this word? Um, instead of four other words. Close reading is ideal for that. And there's some interesting research by cognitive scientists, um, it, it may be only one study, showing that actually vocabulary depth, how much you know about a word, all the different senses, what are all the different senses that you know about, about the word ground? It's, it's what you stand on, but it also is an ideological position. It's also a wicked one. He defended his ground. Um, he's a well-grounded person. He ground the sugar into the drink. Um, how, how much you know about a word, and also the, the, the antonyms for the word, and the um, different, uh, what's the term at the end of the word? Tenses? Ten, oh. ten, not tenses, but you know the suffixes that, that make the word differently, how it's used in different parts of speech. The more you know about the word, the more likely you are to be a, um, a proficient reader. And close reading is ideal for that. So, so you have the first read for read aloud to develop fluency and to bring everybody into the text. The second read to start examining the features of the text that make it complex. The third read, and these can overlap, um, knowledge of words and knowledge of the world, particularly vocabulary, vocabulary depth, and then standards that make sense, um, that are not shoehorned in, but that fit to this text. And what we see a lot of, to some extent, certainly in, in, in the weaker programs, but sometimes even, even in the programs that we really think are, are top notch, tech standards will be shoehorned into the text to make sure that they're, they're covered. And that's really not a good use of, of time when you have all these opportunities to learn about complex text, to learn about words, to learn about the world. Um, to shoehorn in standards that don't make any sense is, is, is problematic. Okay, because so that's, that's a mouthful. Yeah, that was helpful. I'm actually wondering if we can talk a little bit more about that last thing you said about kind of forcing them in the standards in. I think that happens often with comprehension strategies. And I'm wondering if we can kind of discuss that because that's you know, like a hot button topic. Well, like, what does the research say about teaching comprehension strategies? Because there, there seems to be this debate and that seems to be where we're doing a lot of forcing. Yes. And standards often name a comprehension strategy, along with other things. There's overlap. For There's sure. definitely overlap. There, there, certainly in the Common Core, there was between standards two and nine. The readings, you know, one and ten are unique and special, and we love. But two and nine are pretty, yeah, ordinary. And right, like I felt like we were always just trying to force kids to find the main idea. I was like, I, can I find the main idea right now? I'm not sure. You well, know, like yes, let alone that there might be three. And right, three. correct, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. There might. <laughs> So yeah, I, I'll start. Um, we have a lot to say. First of all, you know, we we think we think at this point, summative and high pressured and high accountability assessment has done way more harm than good. We just found out that in Canada, kids are tested a total of three times in their public school life. Three. Oh and, wow! And, and, and so, you know, so it's not a thing that you stop the presses. I mean, all over New York, and I'm sure in every urban area like at least six weeks, if not three months or, or instructions dropped and, and, you know, assessment test prep. Is, yeah, test prep. And it's 
horrible use of time. Um, and, 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 and so there's this downward, you know, and assessment companies always tell us, so we've tried to work with them, that they're responding to district and state mandates and laws and giving them the measurements they want. But it's really pernicious because there is no way, there is a way, anyway, David can get into what assessments can and can't show us, but they, the result of a kid failing to get a question act correct is a comprehension failure or a vocabulary question or, or a foundational skills gap or a fluency gap or an exhaustion kicking in. It's all kinds of things. It's probably not because they innately don't understand how to infer. We are a species hardwired to infer. We're a species that can find these things, these subtleties. We do it all the time in our, in our lives, but with text, there's a lot more going on and, and nobody, assessments that report in these simplistic measures aren't looking at what all, all the rich things that are going on. You know, vehicles like Ed Reports, which started, you know, which started as a, a good gatekeeper, have also put crazy pressure on publishers to like, we need to recognize the standards showing up in each and every one of your questions. And then you have this insanity of coverage that is that kind of shoehorning. So there is an overreach there and a misunderstanding on the parts of their indicators and then their teacher reviewers. Um, not no fault of theirs. They're just not trained right in the subtleties of how this should be happening. So there's all kinds of horrible ways that reading strategies are overemphasized and show up. And then teachers are like, well, what am I supposed to do? My administrator says I have to have a standards based question. We hear that all the time. So we know you have a teacher audience, but for whatever administrators or people with any policy power listening, stop doing this to the kids. It's, it's really destructive. So that's my soapbox. David can tell you more of the research behind it and his been. And this is a whole podcast in itself, but um, there, there's two avenues uh, that, the, that the debate revolves around. One is Dan Willingham's work, which you're probably familiar with, showing that, um, yeah, you might, get, you might get a bit of an uptick in, in comprehension with comprehension strategies. And I emphasize the word might, and he, he puts it that way. But you get the same you get the same effect with 20 minutes a week as you do with two hours a week. And there's way more than 20 minutes a week being done with approaching comprehension strategies. We had to review when we worked with Detroit after um, after the state tried to destroy it for 10 years um, and gave it back to the community. They they would they had to pick a new core ELA program, but to cover to cover themselves, they needed a review of the existing program, which was a K to twelve McGraw Hill program that had been around for a while, but it, not so but it had comprehension strategies. Um, they were they teaching kids in kindergarten what an inference is, but they were also teaching kids in kindergarten in twelfth grade what an inference is. So those kids who retained their sanity uh, over those thirteen-year period were being told what an inference is for thirteen for thirteen years. Um, I had that so experience. I, I understand that. Right. I remember in in a high school classroom, I walked into they were like introducing theme as if students had never heard it before, and I was like, I know <laughs> that they have been taught what this word theme means. Now to find the theme in whatever text they have in front of them is a different story, but they've heard this word before. <laughs> exactly. So that's, that's what Dan Willingham said. Can I just make, I want to pivot off what Melissa just said about theme, because we just talked to Maddie McCowan about this, and she is militant on this question, and she's done really good research that the field loves to shun, um, but nobody's ever disproved or been able to pick at, but they just pretend it doesn't exist. She said that's really all that should be taught is the vocabulary. So they, you know, like, when you are discussing the thing that is a theme, you give the kids a common language. But that the idea of a theme and the idea that you practice with, you know, 42, you know, paragraphs and find the theme in all 42, absolutely zero time should be spent on that because it doesn't transfer. But knowing this thing that is sort of the author's passion project and point of writing is called a theme, that that's a useful common vocabulary. So that's, that is sort of, yes, they've been taught what a theme is and that's enough. Right. Yeah. I Review it and to keep say going. The same thing. 
I was like, it just seems like if I were in high school, I was a high school teacher to give them the definition of that word, refresh their memory in a second, two seconds, 30 seconds, and then go right into the text. What does this have to do with this? That seems to be the better use of time uh, as per the research. Agreed. Anyway, yep. David, we all cut you off. All of the women on this call just <laughs> cut you off. We apologize. It's a, it's a, it's a part of my life. The other thing is actual research done by Beck and McCown that we write, that we describe in our book. And um, fortunately, Monty, Monty McCown, that's um, Madeline McCown, uh, yes, you know, thought, thought that it was done very well. They basically did two, three situations, uh, a, a comprehension strategies approach, a basal approach, and uh, what they call the content approach. The content approach is text-dependent questions. What happened here? Why do you think this happened? Um, Which they named questioning the author, just to give it its due. In the book. The book was questioning the author. In the actual study, they called it content questions. And it was fifth grade, and it was two years. And over the course of the two years, the group that, that, the group that got the content question outperformed the other groups on every measure that they used. And not only standard, um, standard type measures or, or traditional standard reading stuff. measurement type, type measures, but when they asked the kids the questions, and they recorded it on a um, some kind of um, what would that would well, be? They a podcast. But Which... they, they but they, there's online there's a, a audio recording of the kids being asked these questions, and the kids who were asked a comprehension strategies approach essentially they got tongue tied. When says, well, can you make an inference? Um, can you visualize? Can you make a connection? Can you ask a question? Um, in the content, there were questions like, well, what happened after this? Or Why? do you think anything happened before that might help you explain this? Or if you looked at it again, did you see something differently? They were focusing on the content, what, what are now called text-dependent questions or, or text-specific questions. And so the text-dependent group just outscored the, um, outscored the other groups, clearly. So did the basal group. That were just they were the control group. and the basal was a little weird as they said because it had some strategies approach but it, it had some strategies questions and it had some content questions but it outscored the strategies group That's on true. strategies based assessments um, which is really let alone student talk time which soared in the um, and text specific text focus focus group I I think it it. Well, does that help with comprehension strategies? Because there's a follow-up to that that I think is important, but I, want, I don't want to do that without. Yeah, I was going to just, just to clarify. So if I'm thinking, I'm just thinking about inferences in my head right now. So instead of doing what Lori and I did a while ago, which we hate to admit, but we did, <laughs> was like, you know, it was an inferences week. So we would teach inferences and we would, like you said, Meredith, practice inferences with a few different texts and then see if they can do an inference with this other text at the end of the week. You're talking about like looking at the text and thinking, okay, is making an inference here going to actually help this, help them understand this text here? And then you ask them a question that asks them to make an inference. You might not even use the word inference in the question. It's just a question about the text that's going to help them understand it. Is that, is that, am Thanks. I thinking correctly about the difference here? Yes, you are thinking correctly about inferencing, except I would say you, inf you, you have to make an inference when something's not provided in the text. So you have to, it's a connection. The thing David was talking right. about making connections back or forward or sideways. That's what, that's what inferring is. It's, it's figuring out the relationships between the ideas and the text. So if there are key words there, if there are words that are pointing that thing out, you don't, you have to notice those words doing that work. So if you said, you know, for example, if, if for example, is, is it one of those connectors, but if you said, um, one notable exception is when blah, blah, blah. If you don't know what one notable exception means or that it's about to isolate a different condition where that other thing isn't true, you are dead in the water. That's not an inference. That is a vocabulary challenge. So in that case, you wouldn't want to infer when doesn't this work because the author provided you a key phrase, the one notable exception. Um, so you have to teach kids to pay attention to phrases like that. So you're not always inferring. You're sometimes noticing the breadcrumbs the author laid out for you, trying to help you understand. Right. So that's really helpful. So that's again why focusing on the text and what the author actually is doing with words and ideas and how how they're being connected. And, and just to go back, just to go to knowledge, um, 
authors always have some working assumption of who their audience is, right? Who their readers are going to be. So they assume a certain level of knowledge, sometimes none, and sometimes a lot, depending, depending on what they assume. And so that's where knowledge comes in. Knowledge helps you infer because it helps you fill those gaps in that the author didn't actually stop and explain, which would be really tedious if they re-explained everything every time something came up, as opposed to you inferring or remember, you know, recalling. Oh yeah, that's another instance of this. So, so yeah. Does that help, or do you need more examples? No, I think that's really helpful. Yeah, that's helpful. I also think it gets into the nuances of okay, there could be like a a kid who understands the text but doesn't understand that phrase. So maybe couldn't make an inference because they didn't understand that phrase. There could be, but they do understand the general idea of the text. There could be a kid who doesn't who doesn't who doesn't get that quote you know question correct because they don't know what notable means right they might understand exception they don't under, they might not understand notable so then they're they're trying to understand well like this is an exception but what like why is it important they don't get that part of it and they can't explain further so I, there's so many nuances here and i think this like this is really why comprehension is really tricky this is why we we want to ask these content questions also cuz in real life it's not as though often we're being asked very isolated strategy instruction questions we're asked authentic questions about and and we're we're thinking authentic questions about what we're reading and what we're what we're watching what we're listening to right exactly yes and and we think the good pro the high quality programs for the most part do this and for the most part do it well um i would like to add to that um the the explanation the explanation using the features of the text uh that i don't think is as prevalent it's not it's not completely absent but I think it's a it's a powerful technique, and you know, it can be used with the the most the, be, the best questions and mediocre questions. Hmm. And it, it elevates the learning to be class wide, right? So it it not only helps the student explain it to herself, it is a it's an explanation offered to the whole room. So it floats everybody, as I said, it, it raises everybody's comprehension. So that that is the power move I think of our whole book is like. Just include that practice of, of how do you know what you know? What in, the, what in that text that you just read made you believe that to be true? And in defending that or developing that understanding is the comprehension you know, that we're back to where we started. Standard yeah. one. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Standard one is important. For our whole society, right? The stakes are high that we actually revert back to evidence and knowing why we know something. Yeah. How do you know what you know? I love that. That's a great way to go back and rebrand standard one. Yeah, exactly. So the question then comes to mind. If the research base is so relatively weak, if it's not on, in fact on comprehension, on comprehension strategy, strategies, if it's not in fact the best way to approach text, why is it been why is it so prevalent and why is it so durable? Um, and I would argue like people are arguing still hard for it right now. Oh like, yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> hard. I, I think when one reason is, you said something earlier, Melissa, um, you said, I'm ashamed to say, or I hate to, what was it? That you did this too. I um, forget. I think exactly you said I, I hate, I hate to admit. I was <laughs> silent, raising my own hand too. Who didn't do it? Um, Our whole, yeah. And I think that whether it's researchers or whether it's people who, um, are in the literacy world, it's hard to admit when you might have made a mistake or when you might have overemphasized something. Uh, I think we, it, that's what motivated us to be very clear, A, to, to, to title the book, Know Better, Do Better, both of them, and B, to be very forthright with our mistakes. Um, possibly the biggest one, in 2010 or 11, whenever the standards were, you know, when it was out and, and the panic had clearly begun, we really had the nation's attention. And we didn't talk at all about foundational skills. Um, and we should have known it was a problem because as, as we lay out <laughs> in book one, we switched from whole language on steroids to a systematic phonics program. And that was the beginning of the rise in reading scores, not the end, but the beginning. And still, we didn't say anything about it when we clearly had the nation's attention. 
Um, and I blame myself more than anybody um, because I was the one who first read Marilyn Adams' book, who, who drove in the beginning with, with, with support from Meredith, obviously, and the teachers, because getting the lowest reading scores in the city of New York would be Motivates cool. everybody. Is a motivator. <laughs> um, and so we, and, and certainly David Coleman was, had no reason to know about that. There's no, you know, foundational skills in his experience. Um, and that was, that was a huge, that was a huge mistake. Uh, and David, I, you just mean they're in the standards, in the Common Core standards? They're in there, but they weren't a shift because, of, I mean, we did talk about it and think about it. They Not weren't, much. I know. They weren't anything new and different. We thought we should have known that what we should have known better is they weren't settled. They weren't stable. They didn't have market share. They weren't being done. And we were in New York City for crying out loud. You know, we were literally sat under the castle that is Columbia University down in Harlem, below, below, you know, geographically below Lucy Hawkins's empire. So we knew that it was a problem, but yet we were like, that's, this is, that isn't what's new about the standards. That, you know, we really are just revoicing the national reading panel. You know, Louisa Motes and Marilyn, who else? The National Reading no, Panel would be a good thing. Louisa, and, Louisa Marilyn, and Marilyn wrote, wrote, wrote them. They were skills. good. And to make it worse, I was the only one other than those two who laid eyes on those. And which I, to, to be honest, which I am, I found that kind of intimidating. I was not a foundational skills expert, and this was Marilyn Adams and Louisa Motes. That um, is intimidating. Yeah, that, that, <laughs> they, those foundational skills made sense, those standards made sense, but nobody was doing that. I, you know, I right. was in schools for twenty years, not not and not not in the evil castle. Um, there's, it, it was a huge mistake. And what are some of the other mistakes luckily, that we fessed up to? Well, was, we were in strategies. We also taught our kids to label the questions on the test. Now, this is before the standards, yeah. so New York State tests were not gameable, but. They were very, very transparent. Yeah. When we taught our kids what kinds of questions yield and what kinds of things to do about it, I mean, that was all, because we had to get a little, a little better than comprehension strategies, but not a lot and not, and not research-based. No. And that, that was another mistake we made. Um, when David first came to Vermont, he got a job as the co-director of the Vermont Strategic Reading, reading Institute. Institute, which was all about reading strategies, disseminating reading strategies across the little state of I don't just make mistakes. I make big you mistakes. Think, yes, you do everything good. Go big or go home. Um, so, yeah, but at least you admit it. <laughs> right, well, that's the thing. That may, may be our singular talent is that we learn and we admit we're honest and then we, we learn. I mean, we live our title, right? So, How do you all respond to anyone that brings up the National Reading Panel? But that was, I mean, what they said about reading comprehension was a lot about well, they were reading the, strategies and that they work. Tim's, you know, part of it is what, what not Tim, what um, Dan. Dan, what Dan says that the do, what's called the dosage, how much time they spent, didn't seem didn't seem to make a difference. Right. Um, and he had some other criticisms that I'm not that I don't remember right at the moment. But the just the dosage is is, is big enough. But the better yeah. point is that there's a research that shows not that does not address the question of are comprehension strategies effective, but addresses the more, what I think is the right question, is there a method that is more effective than comprehension strategies? Right. And that's what that study does. And at the very least, that should be out there as part of the debate. And I don't think it, I don't think it is. But the National Reading Panel, I think when you look at the authors, they were the people that were espousing that. So they wrote what they knew mm. and believed to be true at the time. Um, it's so good on foundational skills that I don't even know how widely it is. I mean, I think now it's starting to get some attention. You're like, well, but the, the NRP said this, and it was the state of the art 25 years ago. The truth is, the model we present in the book of, of reading comprehension, of what, what it means to comprehend as a mental representation of meaning, was written in the late mid 80s, right? Yeah. So, but, but it was cognitive scientists. And who was it you talked to that had a stunning story about being across the quad at Ann Arbor from the School of Education? Dan, uh, Keith Stanovich, right? Someone told us about, I don't, yeah. I don't think Stanovich was at Michigan. Anyway, it was some researcher. But, um, of University of Wisconsin, Madison. Yeah, yeah, that's what it was. But I spent most of my time trying to observe government there. But University of Wisconsin, Madison was a hotbed of, um, whole, language. of whole language. And uh, that's where... Uh, Seidenberg, Seidenberg's been oh, there. Oh, Seidenberg. 
and it made him it, it made him it made him absolutely stark raving mad. They did not want to listen to him at all. The man the man developed essentially a full throated three hundred sixty degree model of how the mind develops word recognition. And across the field there at Baston Hall, quad. they quad. I don't know if it was a quad. It was That's a hill true. in Madison. They they just didn't want any any part of it whatsoever. Uh, there's a there's and he talks there's about this in his first book. It's not a gap. It's a chasm. Um, and and it's also a chasm to when 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 we as educators launch into the science of reading and in the mind of like ninety uh, what percent did it, it's phonics. The science of reading is phonics, and the science of reading is not just phonics, as you know, and it's not just phonics and knowledge either. That's a great addition, um, but still, there's enough. more to it than that. It, we need to fully embrace the, the full, the 360 degree dimension of the science of reading, some of which is solid science, some of which we're not sure of exactly how it works yet, but, it's, but, but it is not just these two constructs, phonics and knowledge. And if there's probably two reasons that we wrote the book. Because writing books is harder. It's not as hard as teaching. But one of which is not because it's fun. Yeah. <laughs> um, one was because we were worried that the science of reading was over tipping toward foundational skills. And, and, you know, that obviously if every single kid could decode, you know, with fluency and automaticity by the end of second grade, we'd be in a lot better shape. So it's not, it's, it's a good thing. But there is more and the more is important. And then bookending that is this disastrous state of affairs with comprehension strategies. Reading, I don't blame any kid who endures a class, a year of so-called reading that is, that is drenched in reading strategies to say, I hate reading. Because if that's what you think reading is, it's hateful. It's horrible. It's deadening and dull. It's not, it doesn't allow for intellectual curiosity. So teachers hate instructing it and they know they're not getting the right thing, but they don't know what to do. And my God, the kids hate it. Um, it's horrible. So, you know, as a nation, we have this nation of kids who don't like to read because they think reading is, you know, inferring, you know, 50 times in a week and then finding the main idea 42 times the following week. And, you know, it's just, uh, yuck, yuck. And I think standards is, is, is a similar issue. Trying to shoehorn the standard into a text or X number of standards into a text is a similar problem. Yeah. yeah. Because they'll see it on an assessment. One day. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. The, the standard is, the, is a, a, an understanding that a student should have reading a complex text by the time that grade is finished. And you build up to it, true, you build up to it over the course of the year. And when it fits the text, you ask questions that, that match that standard. But if you go overboard, it, it's kind of like a goal line offense in football, which is basically on the two yard line um, and practicing, practicing all year plays that work for the two yard line. And then the season starts and everybody goes, holy shit, there's 80 more yards to go. <laughs> um, I like that because I can get down with the football. The baseball is a little slow. We talked about that before we started, but yeah. I like that reference. That's a great way to think about it. Yeah. Well, I used to say it's like practicing to be an archer by running up to the up to the um, target, stabbing the arrow right in the. I got look. I got I got a bullseye. Like I'm right here stabbing it, as opposed to learning all the lovely aspects of archery. This is just awesome. I your book is amazing. We love it. Um, and thank you, David, for wearing your hat in this podcast, so that. <laughs> Just like on the back of your book, you could have the same photo. Thank you. <laughs> and just once again, your book is No Better, Do Better. Comprehension is the new one, but also the first one is available as well. And we know it's available on Amazon. This new one is available on the Scholastic Teacher Store. I'm sure many other places. Do you know, is it like at Target or is it? I don't know. I don't have no idea. I didn't, we'll find I didn't out. want to like burst her bubble. <laughs> your book's not out yet. But your book no. is phenomenal too, can we just say. So, well, I'll we're going to make a, a big social media video if it is actually a target. So I'm sure she'll help <laughs> yes. me. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you should put your daughter in. <laughs> Listen, if we made any other mistakes today, just reach out to us. Well, included, yeah. We're I, on I, it. I All um, of us. That wouldn't be good. Thank you so much. This was yeah. amazing. We can't thank you both enough for always uh, podcasting with us and, and for talking our 200th with our episode. listeners. Thank you. Oh my gosh. Congratulations, both of you. That's great. I hope both of our books sell zillions of copies and we each make at least like 
$20,000. Totally. That's right. Okay, you two. 